Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Venture. We are glad y'all are here. Welcome to those of you that are online. If y'all would, let's stand up and worship this morning. And as we do that, I just want to remind us, we serve a God that loves us so much that he would call us his sons and daughters. And that is a beautiful thing. So let's worship together this morning and have that in mind. Sing this out together. I was walking. I was walking the wayside, lost on a lonely road. I was chasing the highlight, trying to satisfy my soul. All the lies I believed in left me crying like the rain. Then I saw lightning from heaven, and I've never been the same. Sit it up, I'm gonna. Don't shout about me.
throughout my history Your faithfulness is walked beside me The winter storms made way for spring In every season from where I'm standing All over my life, all over my life. I see the promise. I see the promises in the film. All over my life, all over my life. They only remember when I'm with Good morning. Welcome to Venture. It's so nice to see everybody here. Before we get started any further, I want to let you guys know that we have a special visitor here with us today. He is not a visitor. He's a member. But he has been sick for quite a while, and in January, the doctors did not give much hope to their family. But Johnny Baker is sitting in the back. If you guys could just welcome him. <laughs> it's so good to see you, Johnny. We're happy you're back. Um, so I'm Wanda. I'm the children's ministry director here. You probably saw me last week. They made me get up here again last week and this week. Um, but um, I want to thank you guys for um, helping us with our Kid Zone. We are in dire need, dire, dire, dire need of volunteers. Um, if you have any... <laughs> inkling at all of serving, please. Um, Dallas and Lincolnton, we both, both campuses need volunteers 
really bad. And you're going to watch a video here in just a second. Um, but before we do that, if we could get our ushers to come forward. Um, let's pray over the offering. God, we're just so thankful for letting us be here today, Lord God. Thank you for the beautiful sunshine and, and for all the many blessings that you've poured out on us. Lord, I just pray for Austin as he brings the message this morning. Lord, I pray for these tithes and offerings, Lord God, and um, I'm just so thankful because without them, I would not have my job, and I'm, I'm thankful that um, the pastors and all the staff, um, that's, that's what benefits, and this church benefits from these tithes and offerings, and I just pray that you would bless them, and Lord, just be with us throughout the rest of our day, and we just thank you for everything. Amen. Hey, Venture, I'm in the most exciting place you could ever be on a Sunday morning. Venture's Kid Zone. It is a crazy awesome place for you to serve and pour your life in to children, including my own are up in here. And so I just want to show you around real quick and some of the cool opportunities you've got to help out in our children's ministry, and there are a ton of them. So, camera can pan around. Our band's getting warmed up. Long haired hippie dude is my son. He's leading worship. He's going to be gone all summer. And so we need some help in that area. You can spin back around here. And I'm going to let you see one of my other kids up in here serving. Spin on around. And here's Alberto and Ada. Ada's, Ada's my daughter. And they're serving, getting ready for the AVL because we rock it out right up in here. We got the lights going on. We got the words all over the place. We'll train you how to do this stuff. And then there's all kind of awesome recreation. And so uh, every time we come in, right behind me is our, uh, it's like, Gaga pit. This is this is like uh, dodgeball on adrenaline. It's a it's a lot of fun. But just opportunities for you to get in, serve, play with the kids. If you notice, we have these tables around here. They break up. They'll get in groups, have conversations. This is a wonderful time for you to hang out and have some conversation with the kid. So you don't have to be a teacher. If you can just hang out, you can come in and hang out. Let me show you our other rooms real quick. All right, our preschool and our nursery are here. Come on with me. Take a peek at this real quick. All right. Here's our nursery, and we need particularly need help in this area. And let me show you why. See the babies? All right, this is like a down Sunday. All right, so we, there, there's pregnant women walking all over this church. So get your baby fixed. They do all kinds of things in here, from teaching the children, they use video formats, they have music for them, they do games with them, they give them snacks. This is a really cool, we keep them moving, so you don't have to just sit there with a the preschool and figure out what to say for an hour and 15 minutes. We have a full program that's already installed for you, and again, you can come in and be one of those who helps lead the discussion and teaching time, or somebody who just enjoys, like me, playing with the kids, all right? So listen, if you want more information about how to serve in this awesome ministry, Email Wanda Maynard uh, here at the church. It's wanda.maynor at daredeventure.org. I bet you it's going to appear magically right below me. All right, wanda.maynor at daredeventure.org. We would love to get you plugged into our process. We have a background check and a, and a formal time. Uh, it's just a one hour time that you'll have. You'll see the date and information probably right below me on how you can volunteer and serve in this ministry. We'd love to get you plugged in. this morning. If y'all would, stand up with me. No longer I who live, but Christ in me, for I've been born again. My heart is free, the hope of heaven before me, the grave
Jesus to fully praise you it will take all eternity just like Lazarus oh you brought me back stand in a place and worship you for who you are Father there are so many things going on amongst our lives hurt, pain, happiness sadness but God amongst all of that you are still God, you are still faithful you are still true your word is without flaw God you don't fail us God help us to rest in you to rest in your goodness. And God, to find our satisfaction in you and you alone, Father. Lord, open our hearts and minds to your word now, Lord. We love you. It's in your beautiful name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. Amen. Good morning. Man, I'm so glad to see all you guys coming here, man. We got this uh, Lincoln campus is up and going now. If you're watching live right now somewhere, maybe you're out on the lake today because it's starting to warm up. And listen, you can still be around people, and so you can turn it off, just focus on the lake, and then show up and hang out with us tonight in Lincoln. Six o'clock, we do the same thing in Lincoln every Sunday night at the Cultural Center that we do here. So uh, if you know folks in Lincoln County, let them know about that, or you've got plans one weekend, and you think, man, I still want to be a part of church, you can get there. And so it's at what time on Sunday night? Well, okay, what time on Sunday night? Six o'clock. All right, there we go. And we really need help in that kids' ministry. I want to encourage you to to consider it. You can work once a month, every other week, every week, whatever you want. It's an incredible opportunity to serve and get to know children. And you're going to pass them in the grocery store one day, and they're going to remember who you are, and you won't remember their name. But it'll be okay, all right? But uh, it'll be all cool. So, man, I'm so excited to see Johnny in here, man. That just pumped me up. Uh, But there's also another big answer to prayer. I didn't know that before service, but Rick Turner's in here. Rick, why don't you wave your hand? And uh, where, where you at, Rick? So there he is uh, back there, and we've been praying for Rick. And uh, man, we now there's another guy. They weren't so sure he's gonna make it, but there he sits worshiping Jesus. And uh, got some new ticker parts, don't you? So uh, th- it was the heart. What? That's it. Yeah, I, want, I was praying for your heart. If it was your foot, then oh well. So. Uh, <laughs> But uh, anyway, if you got your Bible, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 10. If you're new, we're studying through the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon, the third king of Israel, wrote this incredibly wise man. And so for the last few chapters, he's been talking about wisdom, especially in the light of, uh, you know, it doesn't answer all of life's questions. Uh, Ecclesiastes is a search to try to answer life's hard questions. Uh, Wisdom doesn't do that. Wisdom will never help you understand God in the sense of explaining how there can be evil and good 
all at the same time and all those really difficult questions. But wisdom will always lead you, number one, to make better choices in life. And that actually helps your life. And so that's a good thing, no matter what happens. And number two, it's always going to lead you to trust God, to surrender to him. Ultimately, wisdom leads us to bow down before him and acknowledge him as God and us as not God and to lead us in that path. So Solomon has talked about that for a handful of chapters. Now what he's going to do is he's going to invert that conversation. He's going to talk about foolishness. Now, why is it important to talk about foolishness? Because if it's foolish, we should all be able to recognize it, right? But why do we say, watch this? We say, watch this, because we plan on doing something foolish that we have convinced ourselves we are the exception to. You know what I'm saying? Like, we've got it all figured out, and although this is foolish, we say, hold my sign, you know, watch this, here I go, I'm going to be able to do it. So we all do that in our life, whether it's in situations that are just dumb, or more importantly, in a relationship with God and life and others, sin. Things that we know are sinful are going to destroy us. We just tattoo wise on it and say, watch this. I got it all figured out. It's not going to be that bad for me. I can handle it. And so what Solomon wants to do in chapter 10 is to eliminate for us, as we're trying to figure out how to fulfill lives, how to take everything out of life we can, to exhaust ourselves in living and doing it in a way that's positive, he wants to make sure that we get foolishness off the table. All right, everybody say foolishness. All right, now, so to get into the, there's, if we're going through the whole chapter here, so I'm going to zip quick, all right? Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 10, there's, there's six different truths about foolishness. The first one is this. A little foolishness can spoil the fruit of a lot of wisdom. Just a little teeny tiny bit of foolishness can ruin a lifetime of wisdom. Now, he says this through a proverb. He says, dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench. So a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor, just a little bit. So uh, the imagery here of a perfumer, they they would use hyper expensive oils and spices and things that they would have to bring in from, from, you know, months and months journeys away with traders that would come in. They would trade for the super expensive stuff. And so they would go through this intricate process to develop these, these perfumes, these stupid expensive perfumes. And as they were getting ready to seal it, if somehow a fly could sneak into that thing before it got sealed, when they sealed it up, all that work, all that effort, and all that money would be ruined because when they opened it up, that fly would have rotted and completely ruined it. So whether it's, you know, you, you've worked your entire life and you saved all this money up and now you're going to invest it, you know, uh, National, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, sell everything and keep the worm farm, you know, and so you're going to invest all your money into this one thing and then lose it all or, or the foolishness of, a, of years of, of trust and love built in your marriage and you blow it all with someone you met at work for a one night fling of sexual gratification or whatever it might be, Wit, foolishness can ruin ruin a lifetime of wisdom in a moment a lifetime of integrity and trust and respect for your own self and you go get drunk one night get behind the wheel of a car and kill somebody there's no like unwinding that you understand that so Solomon's like you and I need to understand just how big of a deal the sinful foolishness in our life is it can destroy decades of what it took to build. Now, of what wisdom took to build. Number two, the second truth about foolishness is that foolishness takes you the opposite direction of wisdom. Now, I know that ought to be a common sense thing, but remember, watch this, all right? So, like, we all have that in our life. He says in verse two, a wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's heart is to the left. A wise man's heart's to the right, fool's heart's to the left. Now, somebody's already out there going, say, we told you the Democrats was, was fools, you know, and so it's, it's <laughs> that, that's not how wrong imagery, all right, don't go there, all right, so, because uh, I'm sure somebody will come up with something about how foolish Republicans are, right? so we're not dealing with that stuff, but, but listen, to the ancients, left and right were, were well, let me just read this, J.E. Smith said in his commentary, to the ancients, the right hand was the place of honor and the left of inferiority. You remember the disciples were always arguing who was going to get to sit at the right hand of Christ. That was the seat of honor. And so nothing against you left hand, right hand people, but that's part of the imagery. Jesus, again, in the imagery, Matthew chapter 25, he said, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne 
Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats will be on his left. All right. So you understand the imagery here. That is, that's, that is staunch imagery. Like there's, there's no middle ground between those that Christ is blessing with eternal life and those who are under the eternal curse and damnation of his judgment. Sheep, goats, right, left. Wisdom, foolishness. All right? There is no neutral ground between wisdom and foolishness. Now, why is this so important? Because we do it all the time. In our life, we will justify a little bit of what we know is foolishness as long as we think we've outweighed it with wisdom. But there, and then somehow that'll like bring us to some neutral point of a decision that's not that bad. Imagine trying to climb a mountain. You've got this huge mountain in front of you, and you go, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get me a bungee cord, and I'm going to attach it to that big old 25-foot round oak tree back there, and I'm going to lock it into my, into my backside, and then I'm going to climb up this mountain with this bungee cord hooked to that oak tree at the bottom. Now, that would be what? Foolish. That would be absolutely foolish. But that's what we do. Foolishness is literally pulling you the opposite direction of wisdom. And so when we allow a little bit of foolishness in our life, what we're placing in our life is something that's literally pulling against us and creating a more difficult task in our life. Pride is foolishness. As we justify pride in the wrong sense of the term. Pride, arrogance, bitterness, jealousy, envy, sexual immorality, all of these things the Bible says is utterly foolish, and it is pulling us away from experiencing life. Now, third, number three, the third truth about foolishness <coughs> is that foolishness, foolishness, remember the old preachers used to talk about, I got the can't help it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Some of y'all grew up in church and preaching, I got the can't help it. I just got to talk about Jesus. Well, foolishness also has the can't help it. It can't help but demonstrate itself. Listen to verse 3. Even when the fool walks on the road, he lacks sense. And he says to everyone, I'm a fool. My favorite movie in all, I, honestly, i got to probably list of what I'd call my favorite movies. But one of them is Dumb and Dumber. I mean, anybody with me? Like, if you're a Gen Xer, that's up there. Y'all remember the scene, Lloyd and Harry, and Lloyd takes over driving, and, and he gets on, and he gets back on the interstate. For those of you who don't know, they're trying to get to, to, to Denver, or trying to get, excuse me, to Colorado. And so, so he gets back on the interstate, goes the wrong direction all night long, drives all night long the wrong direction. Y'all remember Harry wakes up. I won't say what they said when they first woke up, but nonetheless, y'all remember that. And so, so they wake up, realize I'm going the wrong direction, and, and Harry loses it. He's like, I'm done with you, man. I am absolutely done. Gets out of the car, and he's planning on walking back to wherever they lived in the East Coast from Nebraska. He starts walking, right? So Larry decides, I know, I need to fix this. I need to fix this. And so he goes into the nearest town, and he trades their full-size minivan. Y'all remember that? For that little kitty scooter thing. And then he comes back, finds Harry walking up the road, and you think, oh, this is it, man. Harry is going to absolutely tear it. I mean, because that was every dollar Harry had saved his whole life went into buying that van. Y'all remember that? And now he done traded this van for this little wingy little scooter thing, like kid scooter. He even had strainer wheels on the back of it. And he pulls up, and, and Harry says to Lloyd, just when you couldn't do anything any more stupid, you totally redeem yourself. Y'all remember that? Like, I, you, I'm in the movie, we're all dying laughing. We're like, because that's the dumbest possible thing ever. Like, who would be that stupid to trade a full-size van for a scooter? Even though it did get 70 miles to the gallon. That was his mindset, right? But foolishness just always has a way. That's what Solomon's saying. Like, foolishness just can't help but demonstrate itself. So just think about how we allow sinful foolishness in our life and think we're going to cover it up. We think somehow it's not going to get out. Somehow it's not going to show itself. Well, let me encourage you, foolishness can't help it. It will always demonstrate itself. There is no way you're going to be able to cover up the sinful foolishness in your life. It will eventually lead you to do exactly what them two knuckleheads did in that movie. You will demonstrate to all just how deep the foolishness is in your life. Now, number four. Fourth truth about foolishness. <clears throat> Power and success don't exempt you from being foolish. 
Now, in America, we ought to all get this, right? Like, that's, we all should be able to figure this out. None of us, all of us make fun of politicians, even our own. You know, Republicans only make, I've learned this, our Republicans only make fun of other Republicans when they know there's no Democrats around. And Democrats only make fun of Democrats when they know there's no Republicans around. But at the end of the day, we all make fun of people, right? Because it just, it just doesn't seem to matter. Whoever gets elected, the moment they get in office, what happens? Same thing, right? It's just it's like they get warped into whatever happens to them up there in Washington. Solomon wanted people to know just because a person has power and authority doesn't mean their decision making is going to be wise, right? Now, I know that that shocks actually some of you because some people literally believe whoever they voted for is Jesus. And therefore, whatever they do is right. I mean, it blew my mind when Trump was president. Trump could do something stupid, and people who were like, Trump, 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 Trump. I mean, Trump could get up and say the dumbest thing ever, and people would justify it. You know what I mean? Like, same thing with when Obama was president. Some policy was absolutely crazy, and it would get spun. So people put these blinders on their heads towards whether it's their preacher or, I mean, except this one, right? But whether it's their preacher or their politician, we all of a sudden, we look to people in power and authority and we start imagining that they're perfect. And Solomon, who is king's like, no, uh uh-uh. Just because you end up in a position of power and authority, whether it's in a business or in politics, doesn't mean you're exempt from this. Watch how he says it. He goes, number four, verse four, if the anger of a ruler rises against you, don't leave your place. For calmness will lay great offense to rest. All right, what is he talking about there? Well, he's basically, the context here is of a foolish king who's spouting out in anger, okay? And, and he's saying to everybody that works for a foolish king who makes decisions based off of emotion instead of intelligence that you better not speak while he's acting that way because he's a fool. And a fool's going to respond that way. He goes on, verses 5 through 7. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun. As it were an era proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in many high places. And the rich sit in low place. In a low place. I have seen slaves on horses. And princes walking on the ground like slaves. Now, that gets a little sensitive, I think, in our generation. But basically what he's getting at here is this. People, Solomon had observed people getting put into positions that didn't earn it. Anybody ever seen that? Yeah, everybody. Like the rest of y'all, liars. All right, liars, y'all work somewhere, and some dude got promoted, and y'all know y'all was over there stirring your coffee going, you know he ain't earned that. That's so-and-so's cousin, brother, sister, he dated the right person. Like, everybody in here at some point has thought that, because it's a reality. Now, Solomon's pointing to the fact that foolish leaders will do this to overcome their insecurities. They would rather appoint people who are enamored by them and fear them because they know they don't deserve to be in the position than they do to put people in those positions of power who have the right to be there, who have the, who have the, the, the resume and the history. In this particular instance, when you're in a kingdom, in a monarchy, people were placed into positions based on their prominence and their nobility and their ability to lead. But oftentimes, kings would pick people, not often, but sometimes, foolish kings would pick counselors who were, not, who were not wise people who had earned their stripes, who had demonstrated their wisdom, but instead they picked people who were going to be yes men. Now the irony in this is Solomon's son, Rehoboam, did that very thing. In 1 Kings chapter 12, I believe, I mentioned it earlier in our study in Ecclesiastes, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, becomes king. Solomon's died, Rehoboam becomes king. But Solomon's counselors that had made Solomon the most wealthy, rich king in the history of Israel ever. All right, you understand? Like, no one ever had this kind of bling, bling like Solomon. So you would think Rehoboam would have been like, hey, uh, I need y'all on my team. Whatever it is you told my daddy, I need y'all speaking that to me. So his first act as king They come to him and say, hey, listen, man, your dad, he was taxing people too high. Folks are exhausted, burnt out. Uh, It it made a successful kingdom, but we are war slap out. People are grumbling, complaining. They're ready to walk out. You need to lower these taxes. You need to lower the work demands. And let's settle down and be excited for what we have. And let's learn how to build it a little slower instead of so aggressive. And if you do that, you're going to keep your kingdom intact. And he was like, hmm. Then he went over to his buddies he had grown up with. 
Not the guys who had ever had any position of power or leadership. They know literally nothing, but they've been his boys. They've been out partying with him all these years. That's all they've ever done is party since they were little kids. And he goes to his party buddies, and he's like, what do y'all think? And they're like, well, I tell you what, man. I tell you, you ought to raise the taxes. Your name Ray A. Boam, brother. And everybody's going to serve you, and you better put it forward. You better tell them who you are. Ray Boam, that's right. That's who I am. So Ray Boam goes over and tells his dad's wise counselors that made his dad the most wealthy man in the world he tells him nah I ain't really interested in what you got to say I'd rather listen to my boys from down there when we go hang out at the pool with the ladies you know like they know what they're talking about and Rehoboam completely wrecked the kingdom it was never unified as a nation again he split the nation of Israel and it never returned to what David and Solomon had created one act of foolishness can spoil generations of wisdom all because what? He was too foolish to listen to people who disagreed with him. So power and success don't exempt you from being foolish. Listen, think about that in your context. In your context, as a husband, as a mother. Just because you have kids doesn't mean you're a wise mom. Just because you have a business that's doing okay doesn't make you the genius that forever knows how to do it. Y'all follow me? All right, now, number five. The fifth truth about wisdom. A fool will absolutely destroy himself with his own words. <laughs> Let's skip this one. Because <laughs> he talks about people who talk too much. And I'm like, no, well, that's not me. I don't think. All right, so, all right, so listen. A fool, this is the truth about foolishness. It, it leads you to be foolish with words. I mean, regardless of where you stand on Republican or Democrat, we could probably all agree had somebody took Donald Trump's Twitter away from him, he'd probably still be president. Just total fool with his words. And it destroyed a lot of things. So you can make a lot of good decisions and totally nullify them with your words. Your words are powerful. Listen to what, listen to what he says here. Uh, before I get through to verse 8, verse 12 gives us the context of verses 8, 9, 10, and 11, and then 13 and 14. So right in the middle of this, we find the context. He says, the words of a wise man's mouth win him favor. Somebody forgot to tell Trump this. All right. The words of a wise man's mouth win him favor, but the lips of the fool will consume him. All right. So all the Proverbs that are built around verse 12, this is the context of it. Wise man's words People fall in love with them and want to help and be a part of the team. Fool's words, they run from them and they're scared of them, destroys things, and he ends up wrecking himself by his own words. Watch now, so that's the, everybody say context. All right, that's the context of these other verses. So let me walk you through them because there's some really good stuff to learn here. Uh, verse eight and nine, he says, He who digs a pit, now remember, these are all referencing words and language. He who digs a pit will fall into it, and a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stone is hurt by them, and he who splits logs is endangered by them. Notice that it's the thing that they're doing that ends up hurting him. You dig the pit, and it's the pit they end up falling into. The serpent, now that was a weird one. I had to, I had to do some research on that. I never, heard, like, I never heard of like going into a wall and you get bit by a snake. That's kind of odd. But a lot of commentators think they're talking about the walls that are built for sheep and stuff, rock walls, and, and you start taking this rock wall apart to open it up, whatever you might be. You better be careful because them snakes live in them rocks. Uh, Y'all with me? So the very thing you're doing to, to do something constructive ends up being the thing that gets you hurt. He goes on. He quarries a stone. Stone, digs it out, ends up being hurt by the stone. The guy who splits the log ends up being killed or endangered by the log. In other words, the illustration is pointing again to words. A fool says words that he thinks that he intends to be good words. But because he's a fool, he ends up being hurt by those words. Y'all seeing the illustration here? Verse, verse number 10, he says, If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge... He must use more strength. But wisdom helps one to succeed. Now, again, this is about words. Now, I couldn't help when I saw that proverb. If the iron's blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength. But wisdom helps one to succeed. I could not get my head out of what happened to me one time. I, so those of you who know me, I'm really big into my yard, you know, and, 
and uh, I'm, I don't quite go out and measure grass with a, you know, a bound, with a, with a measuring stick and stuff, but it's, it's, it's pretty bad, you know, so uh, it's just my thing, some of y'all spend a fortune on catching bass, I like grass, like the kind you cut, not the kind you smoke, right, so I should clarify that on the internet, police will be waiting for me, but, uh, so I'm out there redoing a natural area, you know, and I had this tree, and I cut this tree down, and and uh, I was trying to get rid of this stump, you know, so I'm out there, and so I've got a, I got a tool called a mattock. Anybody know what a mattock is? It, it's a great tool. It, it's a grub and hoe and an axe all put together on one head. It's a great tool, and so I use it to plant plants, but when, when you learn red clay is like one step above concrete, you know, so it's, it's a lot easier to dig a hole in red clay with a mattock than it is a shovel, and anyway, so I get this mattock out, and I'm trying to dig this stump up, you know, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm wailing on this thing, and I'm wailing on it, and I'm wailing on it, and I'm using everything, and I'm getting down these roots, and I cannot get through these roots. But I am like, about, now I've used this mattock for years, years I've had this thing. And I'm wailing on this deal, and wailing on this deal, and I'm getting madder. I'm a competitive guy, and now I'm mad at the mattock because I can't get through these roots, and it's not even like it's a hickory or something. I'm like, this is ridiculous. And so I got this, my Apple Watch. My Apple Watch starts beeping at me because my heart rate is so high. So my Apple Watch is like, hey, um, you might want to slow down. I'm like, you know, and it's like August, a sweat going. It was so crazy bad of my fury trying to dig this stump that there was actually a Lowell, uh, Lowell Waterworks guy going through the neighborhood to check the sewage pump and saw me, left, went and got a Gatorade, came back and gave me the Gatorade and told me to take a break. All right, that's how bad it was. And he, he's come to our church some. He's like, preacher, you, you need to take a break. You don't really look good. I'm out there. I mean, I don't know. If, maybe I was saying some words. I don't know. I was thinking them. I just don't think. Maybe they came out. I don't know. But I'm just. So finally, here's what happened. I'm trying to get through this stump. I'm about to die. There's a man who actually thinks I'm going to die who literally stops and gets me to, to, to quit for a minute. And as I'm drinking this Gatorade, I thought, you know, I wonder if you're supposed to sharpen a matic every now and then. Never. It's something as simple as that. So right, I go in and I'm, I didn't even have anything to sharpen it with. I ran up to the little cheap tool place, bought me a grinder, you know, and I sharpened the blade. Y'all understand how easy that stump came up out of that ground when I actually had a sharp matic? You know what I mean? Like, it was like one whack through that root, one whack right through that. I was like, this is amazing, right? Work smarter, not harder, right? So that's the whole concept here. But I got a good workout. <laughs> I, was, I was really hungry that night. The point of the story is to illustrate exactly what verse 10 is about. It, it is amazing when we will just pause and think about what we're going to say before we say it. And then speak something sensible, constructive. That it creates momentum with, with almost ease sometimes. But in our fits of anger or jealousy or envy or, or whatever it might be, where we're really just self-absorbed, and we start spitting out words, it ends up making much bigger messes for us to clean up. The wise word goes right through and accomplishes. The fool's word just creates more work. Kind of like... Donald Trump's marketing team when he had to fix everything. All right, now, verse 11. He said, if the serpent bites before it is charmed. Again, speaking of words. If the serpent bites before it's charmed, there's no advantage to the charmer. Speaking of timing of words. Everybody say timing. Ever say the right thing at the wrong time? Yep, turns out to be the wrong thing. You know, I want every married man in the room to raise their hand. All right, because we've all said the right thing at the wrong time. All right, there we go. I was just going to go and keep you from being liars. Verse 13 and 14. He summarizes this up this way. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness. Again, a fool in his words. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness. And the end of his talk is evil madness. A fool multiplies words, though no man knows what it is to be, and who can tell him what will be after him? In other words... The fool says something dumb, and he only follows it up with more foolish stuff that makes it worse. Just keeps digging the hole deeper, thinking if I'll just keep digging, somehow I'll get out of the hole. Wise people learn to use words. Everybody say words. There is the most obvious expression of your wisdom level is your mouth. The most obvious expression of your submission to God is your mouth. 
the first testimony, generally speaking, of our refusal to live in submission to God is our mouth. And it's why there is so much, even in the New Testament, about our mouth and our words and what they do. How they destroy marriages. How they wreck relationships with children. How they tear up business deals. It's amazing. Out of the heart is where this stuff comes. The foolishness wasn't in your mouth. The foolishness was in your heart. And that's what's hard to admit. The sixth truth. Number six. The sixth truth about foolishness is that foolish leaders, leadership burdens everybody. Foolishness is contagious, okay? There's, people go, well, it's my life and my business. No, it's not. Every decision you make impacts everyone around you. The, the, the idea that your life's decisions are only isolated to your experience only announce how utterly stupid and foolish you actually are. Every decision you make affects everyone around you. Do you understand that? And so he says in verse 15, The toil of a fool wearies him, for he does not know the way to the city. It's a general testimony of a, of a dumb lead, a dumb, just a complete foolish person. The picture, when you raise crops, you raise them outside the city, but you sold them in the city. So only a fool would put all the efforts into raising all these crops and not even know how to go into the city to sell them. That, that's basically what the proverb is getting at. He then goes to verse 16. Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child and your princes feast in the morning. Lord bless you if you got a kid king because he ain't old enough to be mature. Now, I know when we were all 22, 25 years old, we were convinced if we just became president, we'd fix it all. Y'all remember that? Maybe some of y'all weren't like that. I was. You know what I'm saying? But it takes years to get wisdom. As wise as I, we all might have thought, and nothing against you 20-year-olds, all right? I'm just trying to help you. You're, you're going to be wiser when you realize that you're not real wise yet. And that means you're going to rely on people who are older than you to give you some information. They've been there, they've done that, and they got the scars to prove it. We talked about that before. So he says, Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child and your prince is feast in the morning. What's, that got? What's he talking about feasting in the morning? Well, that's what was Rehoboam's crew. He had to, woo, he had to party, guys. They weren't really willing to embrace their responsibility as leaders. They were just, just felt entitled and in the opportunity. And so, hey, we got all this money, got all this wealth, got all this power. We're just going to get up and party every day and let the whole kingdom just go to hell in a handbasket because they weren't doing their job. So woe to you when you got foolish leaders who don't embrace their responsibilities. Goes on, verse 18. Verse 17. Happy are you, O lamb, when your king is the son of nobility, and your princes feast at the proper time for strength, not for drunkenness. Again, to, often, imagine in a feast, military alliances, uh, economic alliances, political alliances were always create, created at these big dinners. So you have these big dinners, you invite everybody over, right? and then you're, you're socializing, and you, sit, you take that right moment as the leader, you recognize the moment, and you establish this new trade relationship that's going to benefit your kingdom, and everybody's happy, and you all go home, and it's all good. But when you got a fool as a leader, he invites everybody in, they all show up. He ends up in a drunken rage and ends up sleeping with the other guy's wife or cusses somebody out. Y'all follow me? It's the fool who ends up drunk and ruins it, Instead of realizing the opportunity, again, speaking of the consequences of foolish leadership. Verse 18, through sloth, the roof sinks in, through indolence, the house leaks. In other words, you got a leader who's a procrastinator and lazy, the whole kingdom falls apart. The whole kingdom's leaking. Verse 19, bread is made for laughter, wine gladdens life, money answers everything. Kind of like verse 17, a wise king knows how to use bread, knows how to use laughter, knows how to have wine, knows how to do all these things, a fool doesn't. And finally in verse 20, even in your thoughts, do not curse the king, nor in your bedroom curse the rich, for a bird, for a bird of the air will carry your voice, or some winged creature tell you the matter. Again, what he's speaking about is if you're, he's, he's kind of giving advice to people who have a foolish leader. And you need to know, you need to make, you need to, those thoughts of how big of a fool that leader is, you need to get that mess out of your head. 
because ain't nobody got no poker face. You know what I'm saying? Like eventually it's going to get out. If you're, if you got a foolish leader who can't handle criticism and won't listen to the things that they need to do, then, then if you're in that kind of kingdom, you, you better, I would advise you in the modern day America, you work for that guy, find another job. You know what I mean? Like you need to move on.org. The point he's making here is this. The leadership decisions you make, whether it's husband, dad, mom, wife, whatever it is, it's affecting everyone. That's the big idea here. And those foolish decisions are epitomizing as Proverbs by people who don't recognize the responsibility that they have in front of them. A father who doesn't recognize the responsibility that he has in these children that are growing up under his leadership and look up to him regardless. A mother who doesn't recognize the responsibility that she has in these kids. A husband and a wife who are not recognizing the responsibility they have in this marriage. You understand? Our decisions, when we don't recognize the moment and the responsibility are foolish decisions. And they have massive consequences. That's the ultimate point here. Now, here's where I want to go in a challenge. Those are six basic truths about foolishness. Very basic. And if you're like me, when I was done studying chapter 10, I was very focused on a lot of other people. For instance, I've had fun picking on Donald Trump, right? And his absolute stupidity on his Twitter account. The... Every time the subject of foolishness comes up, the images are of other people in our minds. Are they not? It's always other people. The gospel gives us the courage and wisdom to see, focus, and resolve our own foolishness. Whose foolishness are you most aware of and concerned about? Yours or somebody else's? Like seriously, whose foolishness are you most concerned? As I was saying all that stuff, some of y'all are like, my wife. Right. Some of you other talking about, well, it's, it's that you got five kids, it's the third kid, the second, like whatever it was, your mind, I promise you, kept drifting to the fool that you know in your life. Like, boy, they really need to hear this sermon. I'll tell you what. <laughs> but y'all remember what Jesus said? L- listen to what Jesus said. Jesus once spoke to some people and he told them, you need to make sure that you get the log out of your own eye before you worry about the speck in somebody else's. Y'all remember that? Listen to the scripture. It says in, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 35, you hypocrites, first take the log out of your own eye and then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. But did you notice he's not saying don't take the speck out of your brother's eye. He said if you'll get the log out, what's the next word? Then... You'll see clearly. I mean, just imagine you got a log in your eye and you're trying to get a speck out of mine. You're going to be smacking me in the head. <clears throat> like, that's going to hurt. Get the log out of your eye. I think it's a speck out of mine. So this thing's getting misunderstood all the time. People are like, yeah, that's right. We don't ever need to worry about anybody else's. No, I want you. Like, if I've got something in my eye, like, if, help me. You know, if I'm walking around stabbing myself in the face, I would appreciate you taking a knife out of my hand and duct taping my hand to my head. Like, help me. But I don't appreciate it if you got a log sticking out of your eye. Because as you try to get a knife out of my hand, you're going to knock me out with the log. Right? So get the log out of your eye, then you can help me with the knife. Does that make sense? But we get so consumed and we redirect. The classic story in the Bible of this redirection is in John chapter 4. Jesus meets a woman at the well. And he says to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up into eternal life. So he meets this woman at the well, and, and, he, and he shares the gospel with her. I've got water that if you drink, you're never going to thirst again. Now, the woman didn't quite understand what Jesus was saying, and she asked to have a sip of this water that, you know, so she wouldn't have to come back to the well and draw any more water. She completely missed the point of what he was saying. And so then Jesus responds to her and goes, hey, listen, you're not really getting what I'm saying, so I want you to go get your husband. Now, this was a setup question. The Mormon responds with a technically correct answer. When Jesus said, listen, go get your husband, come back, and I'm going to give you this water. All right, I'm going to give you the water, go get your husband, I'm going to give them both of you. The woman responds and goes, well, I ain't got a husband. Now, that was a technically correct answer. But it was also covering up her foolishness. 
Because Jesus responds to her and goes, you know, you are correct that you don't have a husband. You've had five husbands, presumably, all through adulterous affairs. And the one that you're with now, sexually engaging, that you are literally with, is not your husband. And presumably, someone else's husband. So, ma'am, you are right. You've had five, and the one you're now with ain't your husband, and you shouldn't be with him. So, that's the deal. Now, this lady's at a crisis moment. The King of kings and the Lord of lords, the merciful, forgiving Savior that came to rescue us from sin, has just said, lady, you're not going to fool me. I know why you're here at the well in the middle of the day, because all the women in town hate you, because every time they turn around, you're running around with one of their husbands, and so you can't come to the well in the morning with the rest of the women. you got to sneak out here by yourself in the middle of the day when it's scorching, blazing hot to haul this water back, because then women are going to kill you. I know you, I know what your sin is, and I know what you're doing. You see, Jesus does not rename our sin as something righteous. Jesus does not cover our sin and hide it and say it's okay. He came to die to set us free from sin, to rescue us from it, and that starts with calling it what it is. You see, we live in a culture that just wants to rename sin and call sin righteous. We want to call poop sugar, and, not, and you get confused while we all got rot bacteria in us. So Jesus says, you've been with five different men that weren't your husband, and now you're with another woman that's not, another man that's not your husband. So what does she do? She redirects. She redirects. She literally goes, well, answer me this, smart aleck. Samaritans believe we should worship here. Jews believe we should worship over there. What's the right place to worship? Ain't they both holy ground? Now, what's I got to do with anything Jesus just said? Nothing, but that's what we do. When our foolishness gets exposed, we redirect, we hide, we cover it up. Jesus wouldn't have anything to do with that. And long story short, he continues walking her through the gospel of redemption. And she finally acknowledges her sin. She goes back to the town. (laughs) Imagine this. Because some of them men may have thought they got away with it. But she goes back to town and tells everybody in the town, y'all need to come meet the Messiah. I know he's the Messiah. Why? Why? Because he told me everything I did. Oh, I need to go meet this guy. (laughs) All the men like, oh, where is he at? Listen to how the story ends right here. Let me read this to you. John chapter 4. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told them all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. It's amazing. Just going on here. Stayed there two days. Verse 4, keep going, guys. I've done turned my iPad off. There you go, thanks. And many more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. And after two days, he departed Galilee. Like, we know for ourselves, this is the guy. This is the man. How did they come to that knowledge? Well, it started with a woman who was finally honest about her own sinful foolishness. She finally stopped covering it up was finally willing to admit it. So it's really easy for us to sit around and think about Donald Trump's tweets or some other person in your life that you can think of that always says something stupid. It's really easy for you to think of your boss's integrity or lack of it. It's really easy for you to think about your spouse's foolishness because it's really easy to not look at your own junk. So my challenge to you is this. As the band comes out and leads us in this killer, unbelievable song to worship and praise the Lord. As you stand before the King of Kings, you need to know He knows you for who you are and He knows all of your foolishness. And there's nothing more foolish than to stand before the King as this woman stood before this well and think somehow He doesn't know what's going on. So let's just get honest about it. And let's embrace His grace. Confess your sin to Him. Be honest about it. Believe that His grace has already forgiven you. Because it did. And stop walking in the foolishness of your sin. And start walking in the wisdom of His righteousness. That is life and peace 
and love, it's worth it. Lord, I pray as the band leads us that we could all be honest about the stupid foolishness in our own life. That sinful, rebellious selfishness and pride and arrogance. The narcissism that we all have that demonstrates itself. I pray we just be honest about it. Lord, that we would not just confess it to you, but that we would repent. That we would believe that you have forgiven us, that you think no less of us. Lord, you knew how dumb and foolish we were. God, when you told that woman that she had been with five different men and the one she was with now, when you told her that, you had already given her the gospel. You had already invited her to you. You knew her sin and you were inviting her to you. Lord, I praise you for your grace. You are inviting us no matter how foolish, no matter how big of a train wreck a person has made of their life and their family and everything else around them, you are inviting every one of us by your grace, by the blood of Jesus, by his righteousness to stand before you, not in judgment, but as a favored child. So Lord, I pray we would believe that truth and repent and embrace it. In Christ's name.
So as we've, we've talked about how these things apply to our lives, um, I've, I've been meeting with a group um, on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. We've been talking through the attributes of God, like who is God? How do we know God? And one of the key ones, key ways that he's known to us is by his wisdom. And his wisdom is informed by the fact that, that he knows everything. And he knows things perfectly. He knows things that I don't know and you don't know and we can't know. And not only does he know those things, but he applies them perfectly in his dealings with the world, his dealings with us, his dealings with mankind. And so our goal, what we need to do then is to seek after him, seek after his wisdom. Ask God, what do you know that I don't know that you want me to know in this moment? And if we always will ask that question, it'll give us a different perspective on the things that are going on in our lives. And it'll, it'll allow us to maybe not get the answer we want to have, but it'll allow us to worship Him. It'll allow us to, to be in this relationship with Him. So, so the offer to you as far as we go as a church is, man, seek after the wisdom of God, but do that with other people. You know, as we, as, as we seek after God together, someone else has a perspective that, man, I just missed. This other person is praying for me in a way that, that I didn't even know to pray for myself. Let the church be that for you. We have Next Steps room. We have pastors, um, people who just love to, to meet and pray with you, talk things through with you. We're going to be there. And, and we'll take all the time in the world we need for that. Uh, maybe you need to get in a small group. Maybe you need to talk to somebody about, I need to go public with my faith and be baptized. See me in there. I, I'd love to talk to you about that. If you're online, the same thing goes in that space. There's people who want to pray, talk, take all the time in the world for you to begin to seek into the wisdom of God. And how can, how can I turn away from folly and foolishness in my own life? Because I have a wise God guiding me in a personal relationship with Him. Let's pray. Father God, Thank you for being who you are, but not being separate, not being inaccessible, not, not allowing your, your transcendence to, to merely keep me away from wisdom, but you've made it available in your son Jesus. It's my prayer. If anyone doesn't know your son Jesus in a real personal way, may today be the day. If any of us haven't taken the step of following you, may we have the courage to take that step, have the courage to step out and say, I, I, I want to be baptized and show that I'm following Jesus. I'm not perfect, but he is, and I want to be his. That's our prayer. May you do your work in the, in the lives of people. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you.